digital team some notice. I'm going to count down from, well, it says I'm going to count down from five before calling the markup to order, but I guess I already have, but we'll do it again. So five, four, three, two, one. And the meeting of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee is called to order. So today the committee is holding its member day hearing. Due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, today's hearing is being held remotely. All members and witnesses will be participating via video conferencing. As part of our hearing, microphones will be set on mute for purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Member and Members and witnesses, you will need to unmute your microphone each time you wish to speak. And statements for the record can be sent to Chloe Rodriguez at the email address we have provided to staff. She's our clerk. All documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. And I'm going to start by recognizing myself for five minutes and say that today we're going to hear from our colleagues about the issues of importance to them within our committee's jurisdiction. This member day hearing is an opportunity for any member of the House to testify before us for up to five minutes on issues important to them, their districts, and the nation. The Energy and Commerce Committee has been working hard to crush the COVID-19 pandemic, provide relief to struggling families, protect consumers, revitalize our economy, combat climate change, and conduct robust oversight. We've made significant improvements in crushing the virus by passing the American Rescue Plan earlier this year. This bill gave the Biden administration the tools and resources it needed to combat the virus. And the American Rescue Plan supported a national effort to ramp up distribution and administration of life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. We also held three oversight hearings on how states, vaccine manufacturers, and the Biden administration are working to increase vaccines and ensure they are equitably distributed, as well as another important oversight hearing on vaccine hesitancy. We've also provided critical relief to struggling families, including expanding access to affordable health care coverage during the pandemic. The American Rescue Plan was the largest expansion of health care coverage in more than a decade. It helped families with their utility bills so that they could keep the lights on, the heat working and the water running. And it also expanded internet connectivity to help students and teachers without home internet access so that we could close the homework gap. We're also protecting consumers by passing bipartisan legislation to help the Federal Trade Commission protect seniors and other targeted groups against predatory fraud and scams. And we advanced out of committee legislation that would restore the FTC's longstanding authorities to get Americans their money back after they have been scammed. And that is actually going to be on the floor this week. We are revitalizing our economy by modernizing our crumbling infrastructure to create millions of good paying jobs to keep us competitive on a global stage and to ensure no community is left behind. And last month we passed out of the committee and then the House legislation that will ensure all Americans have access to safe and affordable drinking water. The committee has also held a hearing on our comprehensive infrastructure bill, the Lift America Act, which aligns closely with President Biden's American Jobs Plan. And we are combating climate change by restoring common sense methane pollution standards that were eliminated by the Trump Environmental Protection Agency We've also held seven legislative hearings on the Clean Future Act, this committee's legislation to aggressively tackle the climate crisis this decade and to achieve net zero greenhouse gas pollution by no later than 2050. Now, with regard to um, today, I did want to stress that our committee has a proud tradition of working in strong bipartisan fashion to produce positive results for the people. But we also value the contributions of our colleagues who are not members of the committee and, that we're, and work hard to listen to their ideas and incorporate them into our committee's overall work. And that's why this hearing today is so important. We look forward to continuing to listen to the ideas of all members as we work on legislative proposals to continue to crush the pandemic, provide relief to struggling families, protect consumers, revitalize our economy, and combat climate change. So I know that the, I know that the member uh, meeting is required by the House rules, but we would have it anyway. Uh, even if it wasn't, because we really think that it's important uh, to hear um, uh, from members who are not members of our committee. So now I'd like to recognize Ms. Rogers, a ranking member, uh, for five minutes for her opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. This member day is really a chance for us to, to celebrate the rich bipartisan history of the Energy and Commerce Committee. For more than 225 years, this committee has taken on some of the most difficult challenges of the day. It's done the hard work, plowed the hard ground necessary to legislate, 
and deliver results. To bring hope and healing to our country, the rich history and the hard work of this committee must continue. Each of our colleagues who we'll hear from today has the honor of representing about 750,000 people. And just like us, they were duly elected to serve and are committed to working on solutions to improve people's lives, empower people to take risk, improve the world around them, and have the courage to dream again. This is what makes energy and commerce uniquely American. It's the oldest committee on Capitol Hill. It's, it was here at the beginning, at the time when our first hopes and dreams as a country were, were being hatched. It was the, at the beginning of the promise of America. Today's member hearing is about listening and learning about the solutions that our colleagues are working on and why these solutions are important in their districts. For those who are not members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, welcome. We look forward to hearing about your work and your legislation, especially on our shared goals to continue to lift people out of poverty, raise the standard of living, and for America to win the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I think you may be muted. I guess they automatically mute me after uh, when you were speaking, uh, Kathy. So um, I want to, now we're going to go to members testimony and each member who is joining us, uh, uh, you know, for the purposes of making this statement would have five minutes and members were given the order of recognition by staff earlier this morning consistent with longstanding committee practice, there will not be any questions of members following their testimony. So we're just gonna run through those who have, uh, who would like to speak. And I'm going, I have a list and the first one that I have, who I've already saw before is the gentleman from Colorado, uh, Mr. Nagus is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member McMorris Rogers uh, for the opportunity to testify today about some of my priorities within the Energy and Commerce Committee's jurisdiction. And uh, I wanna in particular thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership during this 117th Congress. I wanna start by talking about Alley's Act, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. Alley, a young constituent from my district, wrote to my office in 2019 to let us know about issues that she was facing getting her insurance company to cover her hearing devices. Despite the medical necessity of osseointegrated devices or OIDs for people who experience different forms of hearing loss that could be helped with a traditional hearing aid, like the bone anchored hearing aid, Baja device that Ali uses, private insurance companies consistently deny coverage of OIDs. I introduced Ali's Act, which is a bipartisan bill to ensure access to these critical hearing devices alongside the co-chairs of the Congressional Hearing Health Caucus. And I'm proud to have garnered bipartisan support for this bill, including several members of the Energy and Commerce Committee. We must ensure access to these critical hearing devices so that individuals all around the country can access the life-changing support that these devices can provide. I look forward to continuing to work with you and your committee to move this legislation forward. I also wanted to talk about a second bill, and that is the Disaster Safe Power Grid Act, a bicameral bill that I introduced along with Representative Schrader in order to strengthen our energy grid and reduce the risk of power outages caused by wildfires. We have all seen the devastating impacts of climate change in our communities and the disastrous wildfires that raged throughout the West the past couple of years. With the extreme drought and heat conditions currently taking place across the West, this year's fire season has the potential to be another devastating one. This bill would establish a matching grant program for power companies to reduce the risk of disaster caused outages or power lines causing wildfires, emphasizing methods to harden our electric grid and reduce wildfire risk. Our power grid needs significant investments in order to prepare and ultimately respond to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events. And I look forward to continuing to work with your committee to enact this legislation. In closing, I wanna say again, thank you to Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member McMorris Rogers for the opportunity to testify before you today. And I certainly look forward to continuing to work with you on these issues and many more. Thanks again. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Colorado. And as I said before, our practice isn't to ask questions of 
the members on Members Day. So thank you for your testimony, and we'll certainly follow follow through on what your on your request. All right. Um, the next person I have down is the gentleman from California, Jim Costa. Is Jim available? He's having some problems with connecting. Well, I just oh, no, there he is. I see him. Hi, Jim. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for your efforts uh, on what has been a challenging 16 months for all of us, and I thank the committee for its time. Um, one of the many lessons I believe that we've learned out of this uh, pandemic, this horrific pandemic that has taken 600,000 American lives and done so much damage to every segment of our society, is that uh, when we uh, address a crisis, we can do certain things quickly, like uh, increase the production of personal protective equipment, PPE. Uh, but uh, certain things uh, we need to plan much better. Uh, and you can't create more physicians or nurses. And the shortages of healthcare workers that were at the front lines, the front lines that saved so many lives, clearly uh, made a incredible difference. And we should thank them, all of them. I know we all do. <clears throat> this legislation is to provide a billion dollar authorization to uh, create new medical schools in underserved areas or to expand existing medical schools. And we should also do so for our nurses. Frankly, the billion dollar authorization, when you see how much it takes to put together a new medical school is, is really modest. If we're gonna discuss ways to improve our nation's infrastructure for the benefit of all Americans, clearly, we all believe in increasing and investing in our infrastructure, but we must think beyond bridges and roads. Access to transportation, broadband education, clean drinking water are so important. But there's another critical need that requires equal and immediate attention, and that's the access to quality health care. The United States is expected to face a shortfall of primary care providers uh, over the next 5, 10, and 15 years, especially in rural low-income areas, um, communities are expected to feel the brunt of that shortfall. <clears throat> Rural communities have long suffered from the lack of quality uh, medical care and COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated the problem. Doctor shortages are known to reduce the access to medical care by imposing longer wait times, causing people to travel further to see specialists. My bill, expanding the Medical Education Act, will curb the shortfall of physicians by establishing medical training programs in areas of high need, high need. Expanding Medical Education Act will provide $1 billion in funding for medical school construction, expansion, and doctor training in these unserved communities. But frankly, as I said, uh, it's uh, a modest amount of money when you look at the need in underserved areas across the country. Uh, priorities of funding will be given to educational institutions that focus on diversity, medically deprived communities. Uh, my district is a good example in the California San Joaquin Valley uh, where dire need is so critical for more healthcare professionals of all levels, physicians, nurses, healthcare techs. Having medical schools in these areas will allow students who wanna stay and work in these communities to complete their studies as well. It's been proven if you uh, are able to train physicians and nurses in a given area they're far more likely to stay there. Our growing uh, our own doctors, then, therefore, is the only way to confront, in a large part, this medical crisis. The legislation is gaining momentum with full endorsement of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and uh, I think it has strong bipartisan appeal. The, the fact is, is that rural communities, underserved communities throughout the country suffer without immediate action. Um, and I'm urging uh, uh, the committee's support for this legislation in the infrastructure package uh, or whatever means is most um, uh, suitable toward its success. For 40 years, uh, I have supported uh, increasing uh, medical care throughout not only my valley uh, that I represent, that I have the honor and privilege, but throughout the country uh, and uh, building new medical schools across the country, I think will go a long ways and increasing our nursing programs toward dealing with this shortage that is real and is only going to grow unless we address it. So uh, obviously, um, uh, while it's parochial in nature, we're trying to, and the governor in California has put money uh, to build this new medical school in, uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. 
Um, like a lot of efforts that we're engaged in, a combination of state and federal resources oftentimes is the key to success. And that's why I'm urging you to support this authorization. And if you want to increase the amount, that would be terrific. So thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, again, I, we're not going to ask questions, but I, I did want to say that, um, you know, we have a lot of concern about the shortage of doctors and, and the need for uh, health infrastructure in the in the Lift America Act. We do have, uh, I forget exactly how much, but uh, maybe somewhere between 30 and $40 billion authorization uh, for, um, you know, healthcare infrastructure, hospitals, labs, uh, community health centers, with particularly attention to underserved areas. So this is very much uh, in line. Um, you know, I didn't want to, uh, if I could ask the ranking member, I, I, I know we're not asking questions, but if, if you wanted to make some comments, or I don't want to preclude any comments that you or maybe if there are other members who would want to make some comments. Um, okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and both, uh, well, to Jim, I really appreciate you raising this issue. Certainly, the uh, it, it's uh, in my district across the country, the, the health care shortage. Uh, and we, we need to be taking action. I have a, a hospital in my district. Uh, it's a critical access hospital who hasn't been able to open their ICU to full levels. They're at 50% because they can't get the, the healthcare personnel that they need. And I know that that's repeated over and over and I look forward to working with you. Uh, I think this is an issue that bipartisan, we all Republicans and Democrats recognize that we need more doctors, more nurses uh, to meet our health care needs in, in rural underserved areas as well as across the country. So thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Kathy, and your bipartisan support is welcomed. Obviously, this is an issue that affects all Americans and we should do whatever we can to encourage uh, the education of physicians and nurses across the country. And I think if we train them within our regions, they're much more likely to stay there. Uh, so I, I look forward to working with you on this. Thank you, Jim. I, again, I don't want to preclude anyone else who might want to make a comment, but we're not asking questions of the members. We told them in advance we weren't going to do that. Does anyone else want to say anything? Let me just make one more uh, closing sure. point. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and uh, especially uh, uh, Chairman of the Subcommittee, Anna Eshu, who's very familiar with this issue, and she and her staff have worked very hard. And, helping us put the legislation in what we hope is a, a form that will be acceptable to the committee. So I wanna thank all of you for your good work and, and thank uh, my friend uh, Anna Eshu uh, for her efforts and uh, let me know what changes you think we need to look at to make sure that it complies with the overall efforts that the committee is working on. All right, thank you so much, Jim. Take thank you. Care. Okay, keep up the good work, everybody. Thank you. Next, I have Anthony Gonzalez, the gentleman from Ohio. Speaking of Ohio, with all my uh, Ohio presidents on the wall behind me here, is Anthony? There yeah, he is. I'm here. Yes, sir. Well, it's good to see uh, Ohio represented in, in your office. Um, well, Chair Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to address the committee on an important issue that that I've been working on since last Congress, and frankly, for most of my adult life. Uh, and that's the ability of student athletes to capitalize on their name, image, and likeness, or NIL. Sort of a new issue for Congress, but, uh, but not a new issue for college athletics. Uh, as, as a former student athlete at The Ohio State University, I know firsthand the impact college sports can have on our students, our athletes, and our communities across the country. For me, my time playing at Ohio State shaped my life immeasurably and I am more thankful for the lessons I learned on and off the field every day. College athletics has a way of doing that. For many of my teammates, college sports provided the best and sometimes the only opportunity to attend college and earn a degree. That in and of itself is a fantastic gift. Until the beginning of this month, student athletes across the nation were restricted from capitalizing on their NIL because of an NCAA policy. This meant that student athletes couldn't sign autographs, teach swim lessons, or accept any financial award while non-athlete students on the campus had these freedoms. States took matters into their own hands and beginning in 2019 with the California Fair Pay to Play Act, started passing state laws allowing for student athletes to profit from their NIL in their respective state. 
The pressure of multiple state laws going into effect July 1st caused the NCAA to act, finally. On June 30th, the NCAA announced an interim policy allowing for student-athletes across the nation to profit from their NIL. Universities located in a state with an NIL law used this as guidance. Whatever the law in the state was, that was their guidance. While universities located in states with no NIL were tasked with creating their own NIL policy. It was a huge win for student athletes everywhere when the NCAA finally overturned this inequitable policy. But it has resulted in exactly what we don't want, which is a patchwork of state laws and individual school policies that has created chaos in the NIL space. Without a clear standard across the board, student athletes will continue to face a convoluted and confusing set of policies. So, for example, student athletes in my home state of Ohio are going to be playing by different rules than student athletes in other states, depending on what their state legislature has done. That doesn't make any sense at all, uh, and it's, it's horrible for competitive balance in the NCAA. So Congress has the opportunity to deliver this, uh, the, the clarity that we need, by passing a federal NIL law that will create one uniform standard, protect the recruiting process, and preserve the college athletic systems that Americans love. The Energy and Commerce Committee is uniquely positioned to consider legislation on NIL, which at its heart is centered around fair commercial activity and market involvement for student athletes. The committee should hold a hearing on NIL to further examine the issue. The Senate has held multiple hearings to examine the subject, and I hope to see the House do so as well. A good starting point, if I may be so bold, would be to consider my bipartisan bill that I've been working on with Emmanuel Cleaver for the last year and a half, uh, the Student Athlete Level Playing Field Act. This is the only bipartisan bill introduced in either chamber that protects student athletes' rights for their NIL and would provide one federal standard. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, and I look forward to working with you to find a fair, timely solution for student athletes across the country. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and it's certainly an important issue that we uh, need to look into. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased that you raised it. I, uh, you know, my son went to Kenyon College in Ohio, but of course, Kenyon was real small compared to Ohio State. So I, I, they didn't have this. I shouldn't say they don't have, shouldn't, they didn't have the same level of student athletes because they did have a lot of good student athletes. But I understand uh, your notion of uniformity. Um, let me ask if uh, the ranking member would like to say something. Anthony, I, I too appreciate you raising the issue. You, you have a unique perspective uh, by um, playing when you were in college and then now being on Capitol Hill to lead on this issue and really appreciate you working and, and the time that you've spent with, with me as well as working to find the bipartisan approach that we can bring some uniformity at a national level because I am concerned about the, the patchwork of state laws and what that may mean uh, college by college. And so, uh, appreciate you raising this issue today and bringing your legislation forward and, and I want to continue to work with you to figure out how we can move something forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Palmer is recognized. Yeah, Anthony, uh, I was Anna and I share the concerns that you have about how this is going to impact college athletics. I would like to talk with you about it because I also don't want to create um, basically a government um, run program. At the same time, I'm, I'm very concerned about how this is going to impact decision making of 17, 18 and 19 year olds and almost create an atmosphere of free agency with the transfer portal. I, I see a lot of issues that could arise from this, but at the same time, as someone who grew up absolutely dirt poor, uh, went four years of college without a coat and believe me in Alabama, it still gets cold. Uh, I understand uh, your perspective that there are a lot of athletes who would never walk into a college were it not for their athletic ability. But even though they're on scholarship, they don't have the means to support themselves. So at some point, I'd like to sit down and talk with you about this because I, I think this, this is a very complex uh, issue that uh, we need to carefully consider whatever steps we, we take moving forward on this. I yield back. All right, I have three hands up electronically. First, I think, was Bobby Rush is recognized. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this timely hearing. 
Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you recall, but some years ago uh, when I was privileged to chair the subcommittee on consumer protection, we uh, did have a series of hearings and, and commentaries uh, on this particular issue. And um, there were some of us who began to actually uh, have a bipartisan approach to uh, solving this problem. And I certainly want to uh, uh, congratulate my colleague uh, for uh, uh, taking this issue on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I never will uh, forget uh, that one uh, of the witnesses that one of our hearings who was a former student athlete uh, said uh, that uh, when he was in college, you could get a bagel, but you could not get cream cheese to go on the top of the bagel. That, that was what, uh, that's how he described his situation. And um, there was some, uh, uh, an athlete who, uh, who uh, participated uh, and who said that he had been injured uh, uh, while playing a game. And immediately his scholarship was taken from him and the cost of his uh, medical care, uh, surgery and medical care, all of this was, uh, was this, uh, assume this family without means uh, had to assume all these uh, additional costs and he had no support. As soon as he got injured, he was exiled, uh, lost his scholarship and had to uh, provide for his own medical care, he and his poor family. So uh, again, and this is a very, very serious uh, situation. And I think that the American people really want to see the Congress move uh, in a bipartisan way to, uh, to enact a federal framework for uh, new student athletes. And all the other nuances of this particular uh, bill, they can be worked out in the committee hearing and then mocked up. But we need to, without hesitancy, move. The time is right now, and we should move. Uh, to bring this matter uh, to a markup. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rush. And I, I think, I guess I, I was going to say I'm the most senior member of the committee, but that's not true because Fred Upton was here before me. Uh, but we remember, um, I remember when I first got on the committee, Curtis Collins, I think, was the subcommittee chair. Right. And she had numerous hearings on, on uh, college sports, professional sports, women's right. sports, right. to the point where I, I was kind of tired of going to the hearings. But right. it's certainly something that's a major part of our jurisdiction. So thank you. I see Gus. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if, if I might, uh, remember Curtis Collins was responsible for Title IX. Exactly. It came, it came out of our, our, our committee and out of her subcommittee. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go to Gus Bilirakis is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm going to be very brief. I, I believe that uh, Anthony's bill, along with uh, Manuel Cleaver, strikes the right balance. Uh, and uh, But we can even build on that particular bill. And I'm going to ask uh, you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking member, and then also the chairman of the subcommittee, I'm the ranking member that we hold a hearing as soon as possible. It's very important. I've already talked to Anthony about this particular bill. And as I said, it strikes the right balance. I would recommend that we have a student athletes uh, testify as well. Uh, but again, I'm not the chairman of the committee, but we've got to move on as soon as possible. Thank you. And I'll, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. All right, well, let me take that up and we'll talk to uh, Kathy and, and see sure. what we can do. Um, I also see uh, Tony Cardenas's hand is up. You recognized for five yes. uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for, for bringing this forward to us and hopefully we will have some, some hearings. I don't think it's the, these hearings are gonna have to go on forever. You brought up a good point, Anthony. There are students on these same campuses who have the fluidity and ability to make sure that they can actually work and actually have enough money to eat. And you're, I'm sure you're familiar, Anthony, with the stories of students because of their limitations, because they're athletes, 
they literally are going to practice burning thousands of calories and they don't even have enough money to buy a sandwich or even make a sandwich. So these are the kinds of things that that I think that uh, we need to expose and bring to light because I think the average American just doesn't understand. They see on Saturdays or, or whatever day of the week that they're sit watching these amazing, amazing young people play and they just think it's all fun and games, but in reality, they're suffering. They literally are suffering. And also thank you, Anthony, for bringing up the point that for some people, especially poor Americans of all stripes, uh, this is, was the really only opportunity to actually get a good education. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's high time that we in America treat them as student athletes, not just athletes first and students a distant second. So again, thank you so much for bringing this up, Anthony. Looking forward to working with you on this. I worked on some bills in this arena and uh, hopefully uh, our, our offices can work together in any way I can help you. I'm more than happy to do so. Thank you so much for bringing it to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I don't see anybody's hand up electronically. Any? Oh, Mr. Chairman, can I just briefly, just in closing, um, tons of interest, and I, and I thank you all for your comments, and I, I appreciate them all. Uh, as you can tell, it's something that's it's personal to me. Uh, I was a student athlete, so was my wife. Uh, Ernest just mentioned, um, you know, you 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 think of the, the high profile athlete, and you think everything's paid for. Well, my wife was a college swimmer at Stanford in Palo Alto, which is probably the most expensive city in the country. Um, wasn't on full scholarship, great swimmer, wasn't on full scholarship, uh, and so still had to find a way to pay tuition on top of uh, everything else uh, in terms of being able to feed herself and, and whatnot. And that's true for so many athletes. And if we just think of this high profile stuff, it's really everybody. Uh, it can, it can in, uh, impact the highest profile athlete in college football, but it can impact folks you've never heard of who just want to teach some swim lessons, and make a few dollars so that they don't graduate with a ton of debt. So, um, so I really just commend you all and, and I'm thankful that you're passionate about it as well. And, and I, I will help anybody on anything related to this. I just want to see it get done. So um, thank you all. Thank you, Anthony. I remember that's what it was. Kenyon had a very good swim team. That was their big thing at Kenyon College, a swim team. All right, thank you. Uh, the next person I have is a gentleman from Pennsylvania, Fred Keller. He's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member McMorris Rogers for holding this hearing to discuss the critical issues um, uh, that fall under the Energy and Commerce Committee's jurisdiction. Uh, there are two uh, bipartisan bills that have been referred to the committee that I'd like to discuss. Uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic has changed so much about how we deliver health care at nursing homes, long-term care centers, and skilled nursing facilities. Pandemic, um, you know, um, every sector that houses individuals in the congregate setting has been impacted by the by the pandemic, but not, not more than the nursing facilities, which have faced unique challenges, including a shortage in the essential workforce that cares for our seniors. Since CMS issued the Section 1135 flexibilities to allow states to bring on temporary nurses aides or TNAs that provide additional care to seniors in these settings, more than 4,000 TNAs have started their important work serving our seniors in Pennsylvania. It, those flexibilities are starting to be rolled back and will fully expire once the COVID-19 emergency period has ended. If this happens, those TNAs who join the ranks of our frontline healthcare workers will lose their temporary status. That's why Congresswoman, Congresswoman Wild and I have introduced H.R. 331, the Nurses Care Act, which would extend these flexibilities for TNAs brought on during the pandemic, allowing states to determine the best method of certifying its existing TNA workforce and allow on-the-job experience to count toward moving a TNA toward full certification. This approach serves as a lifeline to nursing facilities and provides an attractive career pathway to help meet the growing demand this industry faces. Estimates indicate there will be around 73 million Americans over the age 65, including 9 million aged 85 and older by 2030. This will require the industry to add roughly 1.4 million workers by 2025, mostly at the direct care level. The senior care industry cannot afford workforce shortages of any size. 
I would urge the committee to consider the Nurses Care Act and similar efforts to shore up this workforce pipeline for nursing facilities and senior living centers so TNAs can continue their important work of providing care and essential services to our nation's seniors. Another issue that impacts seniors in Pennsylvania and around the country is certain Medicare Medicaid D drug uh, pricing policies and the burdens they place on seniors and independent community pharmacies. As you may be aware, pharmacy benefit managers play a significant role in the drug pricing debate with certain anti-competitive tactics that raise patient costs at the pharmacy counter and claw back hundreds and thousands in DIR fees from pharmacies months after drugs have been dispensed, making it difficult to operate these small businesses. CMS has determined that there was a 91,500% increase in DIR fees between 2010 and 2019. And this unchecked growth of DIR fees creates access issues for seniors in Part D and increases the possibility of pharmacy deserts. CMS has also said that the average growth of pharmacy DIR fees will increase roughly an additional 10% per year. I am proud to be a co-sponsor on HR 3554, the Pharmacy DIR Reform to Reduce Senior Drug Costs Act, led by Energy and Commerce members, Reps Welsh and Griffith. This bipartisan bill seeks to reduce patients' cost sharing, prevent plans and pharmacy benefit managers from clawing back DIR fees from pharmacies, enhance price transparency, and establish consistent pharmacy performance measures that foster quality care and enhance the viability and predictability of pharmacy operations. Any meaningful drug pricing package must also include reforms to address these DIR fees. By taking action, we can save American seniors up to $9 billion in out-of-pocket costs, as estimated by CMS. Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member McMorris-Rogers, I urge this committee to consider the bipartisan legislation that will lower drug costs for seniors and preserve access to community pharmacies, which are the most accessible provider of prescription drugs in rural and underserved areas. And I might add, we're an integral part in dispensing the, uh, the vaccine all across America. Thank you uh, again for holding this hearing, and I yield back. Well, thank you, John. You've raised two very important issues that our committee continues to grapple with. One certainly is the drug pricing issue, which you know we've been the lead on many um, efforts to uh, control uh, or at least limit price increases, particularly within you know by trying to encourage generics over the years, and then. Um, Certainly, with the, with regard to nursing homes, you know, in my home state, the situation with the nursing homes during the pandemic was was dire. I mean, we had many deaths and many concerns that we continue to grapple with. So these are very important issues. I appreciate you bringing them up, and I yield now to uh, our ranking member, Ms. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Fred. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us and raise these issues. I completely agree about the importance of price transparency and accountability with the PBMs. Uh, with you on legislation and that Morgan Griffith and others are leading on the committee. Uh, we came really close to, to uh, a solution on the DIR fees last Congress. Uh, it, was, it was one of those really disappointing ends, um, but we, we, uh, we don't give up. So appreciate you bringing that forward today. And, and I too would just join on the nursing homes. Certainly they were on the, the forefront and appreciate you raising the issues around staffing because uh, they, they got hit especially hard during COVID-19. And it's going to be important that we are uh, looking at what we can be doing to continue to support uh, the important role that they play in our communities and for our families. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And I really look forward to working with everybody on the committee. I I see that Gus is uh, is that left over from the previous one. He's I don't see him on the screen, so probably is left over. Did anyone else want to raise anything? If not, all right. Thank you, Fred. Thanks so much for being with us today. We'll follow thank up. Thank you. I appreciate it. So my notes say that uh, we also have David Schweikert from Arizona uh, who's joining us. 
Is, is he uh, with us? No, he's not. Okay, and I understand that Ed Case uh, is not joining us. Is that correct? So we're done. Okay, <laughs> we're done. Except let me, we do have a number of members who um, want to submit um, uh, statements for the record. So I'll ask unanimous consent uh, that the following statements for the record be submitted by these members. Representative Sablana of the Northern Mariana Islands, Representative Wexton of Virginia, Representative Higgins of New York, uh, a statement uh, from four uh, representatives, Representative Chu of California, Frankel of Florida, Presley of Massachusetts, and Escobar of Texas, that's together. And then separately again, a statement from uh, Representative uh, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico, uh, Representative Balderson of Ohio, and uh, we also have a statement from a member of our committee, Doris Matsui of California. So without objection, uh, so ordered. And um, let me just thank everyone uh, and all the members for participating in today's hearing. But I mean, even though members come today or don't come today, you know, we're always constantly getting input from people, from the members who are not on our committee. And I know many of you do the same thing and work with the non-members. So we pride ourselves, as you well know, in getting input from all members, not just members of our committee. But unless, uh, did you want to uh, add anything, uh, Ms. Rogers? Okay. And without uh, further ado, at this time, the committee is adjourned. And well, I guess we'll see you virtually uh, other days this week and then be back in person next week. So thanks again. Committee is adjourned.